Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our morning service here at the Tron on this Remembrance Sunday morning. Let's hear the Word of God. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Let's sing together to God's praise and glory from the hymn number 260, number 260 in our Blue Praise hymn books, our God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast and our eternal home, number 260. be seated. With so many reports of terror and war all around the world today, perhaps Remembrance Sunday is more poignant than ever. But some here will, of course, remember the truly dark days of world war when the national freedoms that we take for granted were paid for with such a mighty price in the blood of our fellow men. And we must never forget 
that liberation from evil has a great price, a terrible price, a price played in blood. We see that all around us today as the ravages of terrorism abound, the grotesque spectacle of suicide bombings continue throughout the world today. In Afghanistan today, many of our soldiers still face grave danger. In Syria, many have fled their homes and fled for their lives. And in many, many places in the world, our brothers and sisters in Christ face threats and violence and even martyrdom for their faith. And so today's services of national remembrance assume a fresh significance for all of us, perhaps especially for Christian people. We recall not only the vast and terrible sacrifices made in the two great wars of the last century, but also we remember the many conflicts, the many wars that still rage in the world today. And amid all the conflicting thoughts at such a time of remembrance, one must surely be certain for us as Christian believers, and that is our urgent duty amidst all the turmoil and the convulsion of our world, the urgent duty to cry to God in prayer, to beseech God to lay His mighty His omnipotent hand upon this fractured and despairing world, to control it, to direct it, to restrain evil and wickedness in this world, and to have mercy upon humankind. So let us join our hearts together and pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, We bow solemnly but gladly before you this morning on this great day of remembrance, glad that amid many memories of sorrow and of hurt and of great pain and grief, even at such distance, that we are able to bow before you, the maker of heaven and earth, and come into your presence as your children, knowing that you are the hearer and answerer of our prayers. We pray this morning very particularly, O God, for those who remember very real and personal loss, though it may have been long, long ago, yet today the sight of the poppies, the date on the calendar, the services of remembrance, bring back these memories to be as fresh as if they were just yesterday. We pray, Heavenly Father, for all for whom this day itself is a fresh human sorrow for that reason, or perhaps through remembrance of other war or atrocity or tragedy, or even every bereavement and sorrow of the human heart that is touched upon in such a day of emotion and of remembering. We pray today, O God, for the victims of terror worldwide. We pray especially for Christian believers, not least those survivors and relatives of those killed in that terrible atrocity in All Saints Church in Peshawar, Pakistan, just a few weeks ago. We pray, Lord, for the unfolding crisis in the land of Syria, the bitterness of all the warring factions, for those who have been dispossessed and displaced, families broken, fractured, communities torn apart, and hopelessness reigning. We pray for the dark specter of the nuclear armaments race, resurfacing once again now in the Middle East. We pray, Heavenly Father, for all rulers and those in authority 
who have influence and who are able to bring power to bear upon the governments of this world and ask that you, in your heavenly mercy, would restrain evil in the heart of man, restrain wickedness, oppose and defeat the forces of darkness, and cause those who have the rule over us in wisdom and seeking peace to rule in equity and with just judgment. We pray for those who live in fear under godless rulers and authorities and ask, Heavenly Father, that you would send people to them, messengers of the gospel, which drives out fear and terror with the grace and the light that it brings. But now, in remembrance of this nation's dead, let us stand and observe silence for two minutes with others throughout the country today. in remembrance of all who have made the supreme sacrifice for our sakes. Make us better men and women by your mercy, O Lord, and grant peace in our time through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now we join together in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. Well, let me welcome you uh, warmly to our service this morning, uh, very especially if you're visiting with us, and uh, particularly if it's your first time here with us at the Tron Church. We're very glad, as always, to greet visitors. We hope we'll have a chance to meet you after the service and uh, welcome you. But uh, can I just at the moment draw your attention to these leaflets that are on your seats? There are a number of notices there with uh, various things happening in the life of the church in the coming weeks. And uh, I want to draw your attention to one or two of these. You'll see in the middle all the uh, things taking place this week. Please do note these and uh, note the times and the places uh, if they concern you. 
On the right-hand side at the top, just a, a couple of things to highlight. First of all, you'll see on Friday um, that uh, uh, mainly music is uh, intimated there, but in fact, that's a mistake. This week um, is not mainly music, but it's the ladies' Bible study. Those of you who are involved with that know that anyway. Probably doesn't concern anybody else, but uh, just in case you were wondering, uh, that is a mistake, but uh, it's the ladies' Bible study as usual. Then do notice on Saturday, Saturday the 16th, preparing for Christmas, it's an opportunity particularly for ladies to bring uh, friends along to uh, listen to a Christian message and to try out some of the crafts that are on offer and uh, an opportunity to share together and bring people within the life of the congregation here. So tickets for that are available today and you'll be able to pick them up after the service this morning or this evening. Uh, So please, ladies, uh, do make uh, use of that opportunity. Then at the bottom, we'd value prayer. Do you remember uh, Paul and Rupert, who are now in Delhi and will be leaving later today for Renchi for our uh, partnership there with the Delhi Bible Institute. They're going to be teaching and training pastors and church planters all week and uh, would very much value your prayers for good travel and for uh, good health so that they're able to do all that they uh, want to do. And then this evening, uh, Richard Henry and myself set off for Nigeria to go and visit our missionaries, David and Julie Robery, and likewise, we'd very much value your prayers uh, for our time with them. We're uh, very pleased today to welcome once again to our pulpit, Dick Lucas, who's been with us this past week with the uh, pastor's training course, and uh, Dick's going to be preaching to us this morning. And Dick, welcome. It's very good once again to have you here uh, with us. Some of you were not able to be at the uh, congregational meeting on Wednesday evening, and uh, if uh, you want to know a little bit more about that and what happened, some of the elders will be around uh, downstairs in room six after the service this morning and this evening, or indeed if you were there and you have any questions that you want to ask about the details, then uh, please make use of that opportunity. They'll be very happy to discuss things with you, and uh, if you want to find out more, uh, then please do speak to them after one of today's services. But uh, we're going to turn now to our Bible reading this morning, and uh, we've been in First Peter the last little while, but this morning we're going to be dipping into Peter's second letter, Second uh, Peter chapter 1. You'll find that on page 1018, if you have one of the church Bibles. And Dick is going to be preaching to us from the second part of this chapter, but uh, we'll read the whole of Second Peter chapter 1 so that we get the flow of Peter's words. Second Peter chapter 1, then, at verse 1. Simeon, or Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it right, as long as I'm in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure you may be able at any time to recall these things. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have something more sure, the prophetic word, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Amen. May God bless to us this His Word. We're going to sing again a hymn that uh, takes up this theme of God's speaking. You'll find it at number 546 in our blue books. God has spoken by his prophet, spoken his unchanging word, each from age to age proclaiming God the one, the righteous Lord. Number 546. Well, as our offerings are received and as the musicians play quietly, you might like to use the time to read again these words that we'll be studying together shortly. But as we do that in the quiet, our offerings will be received.
Let's pray. The music reminds us that indeed the sands of time are sinking and that the dawn of heaven waits and breaks. But with mercy and with judgment, we will then see, Lord, that you have woven our web of time with every dew of sorrow, nevertheless glistening with your love. On that day, we shall bless the hand that guided and bless the heart that planned all that we have experienced in this world when we are dwelling in glory in Emmanuel's land. But until that day, O oh God, we are ever aware that we live in this fallen world, still under the curse, the curse of man's rebellion, of selfishness, of determination to self-rule, and therefore to suppress the truth about you, the almighty creator and Lord of this universe. And as we look back upon the history of man's rule of this world, we see the wreckage of lives, of communities, of nations, of the whole world that is the result of this folly and this tragedy in our hearts. Forgive us, Lord, we pray. And on a day of solemn remembrance such as this, when we are forced to confront the truth and the reality of evil in this world, open our hearts and our minds, we pray, that we might receive the light of your truth, which alone can explain this world and which alone can give us hope in this world. As we hear the promise of your gospel that declares that a day shall dawn when light and truth and peace and love shall at last envelop this globe. And so, Lord, our desire and our burden as your people living in this world today is for that day to come, for the glory of Christ to be revealed to this world. Help us, O oh God, we ask in our prayers, in our words, by our lives and by our lips, to do all that we can to speed that coming. We pray, Lord, for your church worldwide, that as little gatherings and great congregations meet all around the world today, just as we meet here, in the name of Jesus Christ, so you would be filling the hearts of your people with joy and gladness and with a determined zeal to make Jesus Christ known. We pray, Lord, for those who suffer greatly for their faith, but we pray likewise, Lord, for our own country and culture, our own neighbors and friends and relatives, the people we love, the people we live with. We pray that you would help us here in the freedom that we still cherish and enjoy to make the most of every opportunity to make Jesus Christ known. We pray, Lord, for our university, Christian unions, very especially at this time, of house parties and weekends away. We think of many of our own students away this weekend for student house party and pray that you would be encouraging and blessing them as they meet together around your word, as they're taught and trained and as they encourage one another. We pray likewise for others who in these coming weeks will go away and for our own release the word weekend later on this month and ask Heavenly Father, that every one of these times would be times of strengthening and focus and vision. That our students in their colleges and universities might live for the Lord Jesus Christ in all they say and in all they do. 
We pray, Lord, for the coming Christmas season and the many opportunities that will be afforded in universities and beyond, in carol services and meetings. We pray that even now we would be praying and speaking to friends and relatives and urging them to come to one of these times which they love to come to, but which is an opportunity to proclaim the glorious message of Christmas amongst the trees and the tinsel and the candles and all of these things that people love. Let there be the substance of the message that can change the world. May it be spoken and may it be heard. Pray for every opportunity that we shall have as a congregation over these next couple of months as the Christmas season comes upon us and ask, Heavenly Father, that you would use us for the glory of Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, also for our many mission partners around the world. And this morning, pray very especially for Rupert and Paul as they travel from Delhi to Ranchi to spend the week there with Ramraj David and his men whom he's training for witness and for evangelism and for church planting all around the state of Jharkhand. We thank you, Lord, for the partnership that we have with these dear brothers. We pray that this week, would be one of real encouragement for them and for Paul and Rupert as they share fellowship with these dear brothers who give so much to the mission of the church in India. We pray also, Heavenly Father, for our own selves here in our congregation, thinking back to our meeting together here in this room on Wednesday and all that was said and all that was prayed for. You know our needs, O God, and we truly have hearts full of thankfulness for all that you have done for us in recent days, for all that you have led us through, and also for all that you are laying before us. We pray, Father, that you would help us to be a people of vision, a people awake to your leading and to your calling. Forgive us, Lord, when we so easily slip into ease. Help us, we pray, to be zealous for the spread of your gospel in the city center of Glasgow here, where you have placed us, and right throughout this great city where there are so many thousands of people who have not known, and some have never even heard the name of Jesus Christ, except as a swear word. Lord, all that we spoke about and thought about on Wednesday evening fills us with joy, but also with trepidation. Would you help us, Lord? Would you gather our hearts together, unite us in zeal and in purpose as we consider for the rest of this month the pledges necessary to bring about all that we hope to do? Father, you have given so liberally to us would you touch our hearts, we pray, and make us joyful and glad and generous givers that in casting upon the waters the bread of the riches that you have given to us, we might see you take and multiply, that the little we have might be made great and far-reaching in its influence for the gospel through all that you would do with it. So, Lord, on this solemn morning of remembrance, we look back also to all the good, to all the blessing, to all the strengthening and helping that you have been to us over these last few years as a fellowship. We praise you that hitherto the Lord has always helped us. And so we ask that as we go forward, our hand in yours you would fill us with confident hope and joy and glad expectation for all that you have for us in the future. And may we, O oh God, be a people united in zeal for the glory of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. For it is in his name we pray. Amen. 
So before Dick Lucas comes to preach to us, then we're going to sing the hymn on the screens. Now, in reverence and awe, we gather round your word. friends of the Tron. It's always a very happy thing to be with this congregation on a Sunday morning. I thank God for you, and so do many Christians down south in London where I live. We're glad to hear of you, and we are thankful for your witness. Well, let's turn again to the unchanging word of the everlasting God. And it is, as Willie has said, in 2 Peter chapter 1. This, my aim this morning is a very simple one. May seem to you to be too simple. I want to get clear once and for all. There's a boom. Is that me speaking twice? I'll speak. Am I booming? 
which I'll try not to. I know it's very, it's very irritating to be boomed at. My aim and hope this morning is to get clear once and for all what, according to Holy Scripture, remembrance is all about. You may have noticed, uh, as it was read, some rather intriguing things in our reading in the first few verses of the second half, verses 12 to 15. Here Peter, the apostle, is desperately anxious to remind certain churches and the believers of things they know perfectly well already. And notice in verse 12, I always intend to remind you. Then in verse 13, as long as I'm in this body, to stir up your minds by way of reminder. And then in verse 15, I'll make ever effort so after my departure, apparently he knows his time is short, you may be able at any time to remember, to recall. And yet if you look at verse 12, we're told that these Christians are firmly established in the truth and know all about the matters that Peter is talking about, so they don't need reminding at all. So the question is, why is Peter so anxious to remind them of things they know perfectly well already. There's something about remembrance that's peculiarly important, and today, obviously, is a suitable time to find it out. It may seem slightly weird to you, but I rediscovered the meaning of remembrance in a dreadful traffic jam some years ago. We were completely stuck with cars stretched up ahead and behind for miles, with no hope of ever moving again. So I settled down to read whatever was in the glove compartment of the car. It was a Bible. I opened it and read Isaiah 51, 12. Now, you may like to turn it up. There's no need because I'm going to read it. Uh, but if you like to follow me in turning it up, by all means, do. Isaiah 51, verse 12 was, uh, I had been fuming in the traffic jam, but I came to rest and rejoiced in this remarkable word. Isaiah 51, 12. I, I am he who comforts you. Who are you that you are afraid of man who dies? Of the son of man who is made like grass, and have forgotten the Lord your maker, who stretched out the heavens, laid the foundations of the earth, and you fear continually all the day because of the wrath of the oppressor. So here is little Israel, surrounded by its enemies and naturally terrified. They may not have had suicide bombers, but I can assure you that the Assyrians were in their prime terrifying people. And as they tremble, God says to them through the prophet Isaiah, I see you've forgotten me. And little Israel says, well, we of all the nations in the world can't forget you. We know that you're our creator. They may not know in heathen Assyria, but we know. To which God gently replies to them, but if you are terrified of your enemy, you have forgotten me. Now, do you see the point? These people knew the truth about God, they grasped that truth that God was a mighty God long ago, but the truth that God was a mighty God who promised to protect them had not grasped them. It was as though in the face of deep trouble they had no God of grace and power to depend on. In other words, they were trembling like people who had no God. They had forgotten. This fear, then, speaks of forgetfulness, Forgetfulness that God has, the God who promised to be their help and strength was no longer there. It was a practical remembrance that had gone. So you see, the Bible idea of remembrance is a very dynamic concept. What it does is to connect us with the past so that we behave rightly and think rightly in the present. Let me give you an illustration. Today we're remembering two world wars, and indeed wars in between and still now. And it's very important, obviously, that we should do so, 
and it was good to see many people hurrying to George Square as well, and I'm sure in churches all over the country. But it needs to be a dynamic remembrance. Let me tell you something about uh, next year and the remembering of the First World War. 2014, a hundred years after the war broke out in 1914. No one will be able to forget the First World War next year. Indeed, we may get a little tired of constant reminder. It will climax in a great service at Glasgow Cathedral in August. It is reported that the publishers propose to bring out about a thousand books on the First World War by the time they're finished. A thousand. They've already started. There will be hundreds of school trips to the battlefields all next year, so you parents of teenagers, you better start saving up now because you've got to pay for them. The Imperial War Museum, which is just along the road from where I live, is, is, is rechanging one or two whole floors so that you can't get into part of it at the moment, which will open in February. When they do a... Uh, exhibition like this, it's always marvelously done. So when you go to the Imperial War Museum, and it'll be worth going down to see it, I guess, after February, you'll see the mud, the see about the casualties, you'll have discussions as to whether the generals knew their stuff or whether they were donkeys. You will hear about the war poets oh, and the VCs and all sorts of things will be in that, in that exhibition. It's interesting, isn't it, that the country feels it worthwhile to spend a whole year in remembrance of that great war, that terrifying and terrible war. I have two little pictures of home of old-fashioned ambulances. I, I don't know how they ever worked. Since my mother, when she was 18, was an ambulance driver in 1914. When I first learned to drive a car, she told me to double declutch. Do any of you know what it means to double declutch? Do you do? Well, of course, you don't need to do it in modern cars. I'm surprised those ambulances could work even with a double declutch. I guess they needed a treble declutch, whatever that means. But here's the question. Do you really remember the wars, the First World War and the Second World War? I think with many people, it's just a sentiment. It may be a deep sentiment. There may be deep sorrow. But there's nothing dynamic in their remembrance at all. If you have a biblical idea of remembrance, you will do something about it. For example, you will seek for peace, just as those men are in uh, Geneva at the moment, and I gather they've not yet succeeded. Is that right? But those efforts are right, aren't they? That's remembering wars, knowing we're in a, a, war, a, a, a world of war and terror. You seek peace. But you also prepare for war and rumors of war, as Jesus warned us. You do something about it. I've been very busy this week with the pastoral training course, but I picked up a daily paper from time to time, and I've been most interested to see several letters and one long article on why the government is allowing our forces to become so small. And though I'm sure the writers are not particularly Christian, what they're saying is, don't you remember the kind of situation we were in between the, between the two world wars, uh, when we failed to rearm so that we hardly had a spitfire to put in the air at the beginning of the Battle of Britain, and it just managed to get there in time. We'd forgotten that the world is a nasty place and we have many enemies. Is it not the case that practical remembering means taking the past seriously and applying it to the present. So perhaps somebody will be writing to their MP saying, what is the government doing, allowing our forces to become so weak, cutting out so many regiments? Wouldn't be much good writing to my MP. He's particularly wet and useless. <laughs> but you may have a good one. Back then to, uh, to Peter. Now, due to what you read in chapter 2, 1, and 2, will you now just focus on that? 
a crisis has arisen. Do you see in chapter 2, 1 and 2, false prophets arose among the people in the old days. Just so there will be false teachers among you today, says Peter, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them. So they'd been Christians once upon a time. They'd belonged to the redeemed community, but now they denied what they originally believed bringing upon themselves swift destruction and no doubt on others. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed. So new teachers are arising with destructive teaching, and the result is moral collapse. These church teachers, I take it, were making a very big impression. They had been loyal Christians, but now they denied the authority of Christ. Apparently, they were undermining the faith of many people. And Peter says plainly that they were destroying the life, the peace, and the unity of the churches where they lived. Worse still, many were following, notice the many, not a few, Many were following their teaching, were leaving the church, the Christian morality that they had been taught for what Peter calls depravity or shameful ways. And that brought the authentic faith into disrepute with people everywhere. Why? People could look at the church and say they're no different from us. This was particularly serious because, as I understand it from this word, secretly, you see that in verse 1? What they were doing was subtle and insidious, and you might not notice it at first. And because they were important people, you didn't like to say, they must be wrong. The result of this false teaching within the churches was divisive. It, it brought the churches into collision with one another. They could no longer be united. Second, it was devastating. It was corrupting a new generation of Christians who were growing up, or rather people who were listening to the church, and now because of this teaching were being corrupted. And finally, it was destructive of church growth. The church became sterile, divisive, devastating, destructive. Now that's why Peter is so worked up. That's why he's so alarmed. It seemed extraordinary that this false teaching and false living had spread so quickly in his time, and this is in the first century, towards the end of it. Very soon he would be gone, what is he to do? So it's in that crisis that he gives a very straightforward answer. He says, the believing Christians are never to let hold, never to let go, never to forget, always to remember one what is it in verse 16 to 18? Just glance at it. They're never to forget, never to let go the apostolic teaching, which we would call the New Testament. And they're never to let go the prophetic teaching, we would call that the Old Testament, verses 19 to 21. Now, this is what, my friends, has been happening today. And that is why live, faithful churches today are holding firm to the apostolic teaching and the prophetic word, that is, to the New Testament and the Old Testament. And we do this on the Lord's Day, on Sunday. We remember what Jesus did for us on the cross, isn't that right? And we remember what Jesus taught us for our benefit in this life and for eternity. We remember. Therefore, there are only two pieces of furniture we need in the church, this end. We need a lectern and a pulpit, not for somebody to stand up and give us his opinion, but for someone to take us back to the Word of God, the apostolic testimony and the prophetic Word, to open the Bible and teach us from it. In other words, the lectern is here to remember to remember what they said in the past, what Jesus did for us in the past, and then to say to you, live differently now in the present. Isn't that what we're doing every time we look at the Bible from in, in church on Sunday? And the table, that's the only other piece of furniture we really need. 
And we have a table on which we put bread and wine, and we remember the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. And we determine not to deny him. We determine not to disobey him. We determine today to live in the light of what Christ did for us. We remember. It's very striking to me that every Sunday is, in this vital sense, a Remembrance Day. We go back to the teaching of the Bible, we go back to the cross of Christ in order to reset our thinking now and to reset our living. That's what we're meant to be doing every time we meet together as a congregation on Sunday. In the light of hearing the Word of God, we want to do what Jesus told us to do, to search the Scriptures that bring us a knowledge of Him. Well, naturally, of course, the false teachers don't agree with that. And so it is the business of the new type of teaching, which is happening in Peter's day and is happening in ours, to decry the apostles and the prophets. They may or they may not attack us personally or our churches, but they want to say that the apostles and the prophets are not really worth studying and living by because they're out of date. So the faithful, living, the faithful churches, as I say, are going back to the apostles and prophets, and the false teachers are decrying the authority of the apostles and the prophets. For example, with regard to the apostles in verses 16 to 18, I suppose, well, when I was at college, they told me that many of these stories of miracles of Christ, of course, never really happened. Because it was years later that these New Testament stories were written down, and by that time everybody was in a muddle, and uh, they felt that by talking of miracles they could shore it all up. But notice what he says in verse 16, we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we were eyewitnesses, first-hand knowledge, first-hand witness. Well, there's no time to go into that at depth and length now. That's one of the things we were studying last week. And then what about the prophets? Well, say the new teachers, they were, of course, very popular in their day, but they were imprisoned in their times and in their culture. And we really can't, in the 21st century, trust their interpretation of events. We must make up our own minds. And I dare say there were people, don't you think, in the ancient days of the prophets who went up to Isaiah and said, that's just your interpretation, Isaiah. I'm sorry, I'm not going to listen to you. Well, that did not happen. Look at verse 20. Knowing, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. So what did not happen was this. Isaiah did not come down to breakfast and find there the prophetess, his wife, and his son, uh, Maha Shalal Hashbez, eating their cornflakes or whatever they did in those days. He did not address Maha Shalal Hashbez. I imagine he called him Bez for short. You couldn't say Maha Shalal Hashbez every time you spoke to him, could you? I imagine he said, so, 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 so you see, if uh, Isaiah made up his own mind about things, he would say something like this, Bez, um, you know, I think the other prophets have got it all wrong. I think they misunderstand the threat of the Syrians. Uh, and I've got an idea that it's rather like this. And then he tells Bears what he thinks. And his son Bears replies, good on you, Dad, get writing. Now, that did not happen. And why didn't it happen? But look at verse 21. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. Isaiah did never come down to breakfast and say, I've had a good idea. I've rethought what the other prophets said. No, prophet was ever, no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were swept along by the Holy Spirit. And so you see Peter is asserting there in verses 16 to 21 that we can rely on the apostolic testimony because it comes from men who were there, who saw and heard the Lord. 
and we can rely on the prophetic word because the prophets did not have ideas of their own which they put down on paper or preached to the people. They were swept along by the Holy Spirit in order to speak the word of God. So the apostles tell us the word of God through the Lord Jesus Christ and the, prophet, the apostles and the prophets tell us the word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. I so like verse 19, and I'm going to address it to you. We have something more sure, the prophetic word, to which you, you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. That means we've got to study the scriptures and live by them until Christ returns, and on that day, we shall enjoy a perfect inward illumination. We shall know as we are known. Let's pray. Forgive us if we forget what we have learned. Forgive us, Heavenly Father, even more if we deliberately forget what we have learned in order that we might live as we want to. Forgive us if we have deliberately put aside these great facts which can never be changed. Forgive us that we have so often lived as though Christ has not died for us. And so we pray that what you have taught us what you have done for us may be the power, the truth that controls both how we think and how we live. And above all this morning, we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ and that sacrifice. We think of those many stones in the cemeteries all over Europe with the name of a soldier and then underneath the sign of the cross. And we thank you that that makes all the difference. In Christ's name, amen. Well, thank you, Dick, for bringing us that word. We're going to finish our service this morning by singing. You'll find the hymn at number 555, 555 in our blue books. A great hymn by Charles Wesley about this very thing that Peter is urging us to remember. Lord God, who breathed your word of old on those who wrote the sacred page, the same through all the years untold to us in our degenerate age, the spirit of your word in part and breathe his life into our heart. Number 555.
Let's pray as we stand. You are therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen.